I'm going to just kick off the event by talking a few minutes about uh, open source in uh, 2017. Uh, and it's been uh, a pretty incredible uh, year in open source. And, uh, you know, things just keep getting better. And today I thought I would talk to everyone about just how open source isn't growing, it's actually accelerating exponentially in terms of its influence in technology and in society. And, and these numbers are just amazing. There are 23 million open source developers worldwide. Uh, I think there are like 22 million uh, accounts on, on GitHub, 64 million repositories, 41 million lines of code, 1,100 new projects every single day. And then there are 10,000 new versions of different open source projects every single day. It's pretty amazing, just the growth and the sheer number of developers and projects in open source. And even within individual projects, speed is accelerating. In other words, the pace of development, not just the number of projects, is accelerating. Linux is the best example of this. Uh, Greg Crow Hartman, who works on the Linux kernel, uh, gave me these numbers uh, as a refresh. Uh, today we have 4,300 developers changing 10,000 lines, or uh, adding 10,000 lines of code a day, modifying 2,000, uh, removing 2,500. Think about that. A code base that changes eight and a half times an hour. I mean, it's just self-evident that at this point, no single organization, no single uh, person could ever keep up with a development pace that fast, that robust. And you know what's interesting about Linux and I think this is, is probably a precursor to other uh, uh, trends that we're seeing in the industry, is that every market that Linux has entered, which is somewhat unusual for a, a, an operating system or technology to sort of leap from one sector of computing to another, but every market it's entered, it hasn't just done well, it's come to completely dominate. And you know, Greg reminded me yesterday, it's not only come to dominate, but nobody had to use it. Right? The, the, you know, it's, it's totally free and it's a voluntary thing for people to use, but just look at these numbers. It pretty much is the entire supercomputing market. M almost all mainframes run Linux. 90% of all the public cloud workloads out there are Linux, embedded systems, it's majority market share. I mean, it's incredible to see this. Some new numbers from just in 2017. With Android, which of course runs with Linux, uh, is 82% of the mobile device world. So in mobile, Linux absolutely dominates. This year, for the first time, <coughs> Linux has uh, exceeded Unix in the enterprise server market. Now is sort of just behind the Windows server in the you know, sort of on-prem enterprise uh, server market, uh, according to IDC. Nine out of the top 10 public clouds run Linux. But this was the number, this last number here is the one I was most excited about. In March of this year, it, it, largely due to Android, but Linux-based clients became the majority of clients on the internet, surpassing Windows for the first time this year. So do you know what all, do you know what that means? 2017, say it with me, the year of the Linux desktop. We finally made it, it is official, this is the year. That's right. So it, it's just amazing. And you know, it, it's, it's not just software that's e eating the world, which is you know, something people say all the time, how important software has become in all of our lives, this concept of digital transformation. But it's actually open source software that's eating the world. The software that's eating the world really is open source. Because today, nobody makes anything without open source. It's just a fact of how uh, modern application development works. You know, creating applications these days is a lot like making a sandwich. Um, the CEO of SourceClear helped me with this metaphor, and, and I think it's a really good one. But if you think of the way apps get developed today, it'll show you just how important open source is. So think of a building an app like a code club sandwich, right? Where, you know, for the, the bread, you choose a framework. Now, we're big fans of uh, Node.js here at the Linux Foundation, so uh, that might be a good framework for folks to choose. In fact, it is one of the most popular frameworks for developers to work with uh, to build any modern application these days. 
And so you choose a framework and then you start writing your code, right? And of course, you're making an application for whatever you need, and so there certainly is custom code, and that could be in some cases proprietary, it could be open source, but you write your custom code, right? And as you're writing it, what you do is then go to one of the hundreds of thousands of packages, whether it's NPM or other repositories, and you start using libraries that you find there to solve problems. And there are hundreds of thousands of examples of problems that have already been solved that you don't need to solve yourself as a developer to solve those problems. And when you add up just the lines of code that happen through this process, what you see is open source code ends up being the vast majority of the code that you actually use to build a modern application. That 10% is the important code because developers understand what their customers need or what their fellow developers might need or whoever their users are and what they might need, but the vast majority of code these days really is uh, open source. And open source really isn't slowing down anytime soon. Remember I mentioned you know, there are 1,100 uh, new uh, libraries every single day. That, that trend line is accelerating. And you know, there are predictions out there that we will have hundreds of millions of libraries out there that all of us will depend on to build the technology of the future. Now, what that means to everyone is that we have an abundance of code. But with abundance, it's created, I think, a little bit of anxiety. Right? Does, does everybody remember this book? I think it was published back in 2004 called The Paradox of Choice. Right? So the idea here was that in the United States, if you went into any supermarket, there would be you know, 60 different kinds of ketchup, and there would be 100 different kinds of potato chips. And having to choose between those different things actually created anxiety for people, that people got sort of disturbed by all of this choice. It was sort of paradoxical because you, everyone thought you know, more choice is better, but it actually made people less happy, right? That's sort of the thesis of the book, and uh, I'm probably not doing justice to, to the book. But I think we have the same problem, and certainly developers have this problem where, you know, am I choosing the right framework? Is that particular package secure or not? Should I bet my future on Go or JavaScript or am I a Ruby person? You know, which, which one's gonna be here in the future? You know, if I bet my company's infrastructure on this platform versus that platform, what does that mean? And so the real question that we ask ourselves at the Linux Foundation every day, and I think most people just naturally ask themselves is, of those 64 million open source projects out there, which are the ones that really, really matter? Which are the ones that I can bet my future on? Which are the ones that are gonna be supported? Which are the ones that are gonna provide the security, the quality, and, and uh, the code base that really meets my requirements? And we think at the Linux Foundation that the answer to that and you'll hear this more and more in the open source world, this talk about sustainability. We think the answer is that projects with sustainable ecosystems are the ones that really matter. You see, we're moving towards this future where open source is this existence proof that all of us are smarter than any one of us and that we can better others at the same time that we better ourselves. It's sort of this form of co almost collective capitalism is a good way to think about it if you look at this pattern. where you have open source projects you know, Linux is an example, 90% of the developers there are professional developers who work for organizations that depend and rely on Linux every day. Those projects create, they're used in products, you know, whether it's to run Google's cloud and search or power every Kindle or power this uh, Galaxy uh, gear device that I have on my wrist here. Value is then created from those products. That value gets reinvested in the project largely in the form of employing developers to work at Samsung or Google or Amazon to contribute to the Linux kernel or any other open source projects, which begets better code, which begets new products with better features, functionality, performance, security, and so forth, which begets more value, more reinvestment. It is this virtuous cycle that really is the hallmark of sustainable open source, and this is the future we're moving towards. Again, you can see how there's a collective aspect, and then there's sort of 
an individual aspect and a, and a profit aspect of all of that. And that's why it sort of looks like some of these concepts that you see in, in economic theory around collective capitalism and so forth. And so we are seeing a huge rise of this positive feedback loop happening in open source projects. And just at the Linux Foundation, we are home to a whole bunch of projects that are entering into this positive feedback loop. And it's not just us. It's organizations like the Eclipse Foundation and the OpenStack Foundation and the Apache Software Foundation who are all hosting these projects that help in, in move the world and create these sustainable ecosystems. You know, a few examples here. Our Let's Encrypt project. This is an incredible project. Do you know that there is now the world's largest certificate authority is totally free? The Let's Encrypt project, which we host here at the Linux Foundation, have the privilege to host, is was built under the theory of we want TLS to be the default for the internet. That if all web traffic is secure, we will have more privacy, better security, fewer man in the middle attacks, and so forth. And to make that happen, you have to make the act of getting a certificate very, very easy and zero cost. To date, that project has issued 50 million certificates and is the world's largest certificate authority. In networking, we have a project called the Open Network Automation Platform that's transforming the networks of China Mobile, AT&T, uh, and, and about 55% of the world's mobile operators that will essentially allow them to automate their networks through SDN and NFV and then move towards the world of 5G where higher data speeds and more users will be able, will be accessing their networks. This is all in open source. Think of that. The world's largest operators, AT&T, China Mobile, have partnered, huge rivals, and have open sourced the infrastructure that they're using to run their production networks. It's insane. In cloud, has anybody ever heard of Kubernetes here? Anyone? <laughs> Kubernetes is amazing. You know, we call it the Linux of the cloud. It's really this platform that's becoming the portability layer, the, the way that applications will get deployed on private and across public clouds. We have the Cloud Foundry effort here run by half the Fortune 500, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is, of course, home to Kubernetes, but other projects such as Prometheus and many, many more. Our automotive-grade Linux initiative is in production today in the U.S.'s best-selling commercial vehicle, the Toyota Camry. It will, is slated to be in production next year in tens of millions of vehicles worldwide. We have a blockchain initiative that's being used to create a distributed ledger that will help manage identity in places like India, get better financial access to people who don't have the means, who are in poverty through using digital uh, currency initiatives. We'll make back office financial processing much, much faster and allow our economies to grow. We have embedded in IoT initiatives like the Yocto Project, Zephyr, and our EdgeX Foundry that are building the infrastructure for the edge of the network that will handle the load of billions of devices all converging onto a global network of connected things. And then finally, we're home to Node.js, which is the world's largest server-side Java framework and one of the most popular development frameworks in the world. You see, open source is accelerating. Our organization, organizations like us, continue to grow. There's over 800 organizations in, our, in the Linux Foundation for 41 countries, 80% of the Fortune 100 uh, tech and telecom companies. 25,000 developers work on just Linux Foundation projects alone across 100 projects, creating six, nearly $16 billion of shared value. Investment is accelerating in open source. Between 2010 and 2015, investment in open source startups, venture, just venture investment increased eight, over eightfold. Just in Linux Foundation projects, $3 billion in venture investment has been uh, allocated to projects that, uh, or companies that are based on CNCF projects. A half a billion dollars in Hyperledger uh, startups, almost 200 million in Node.js startups. Uh, AT&T announced a $200 million fund for the open network automation platform. I think you all get the picture here that it just continues to grow. Our events continue to grow, as evident by all of you here. You may not know, but we uh, run 150 events in dozens of countries with 25,000 developers every year. There are over 2.5 million people in the meetup groups just for the projects that the Linux Foundation hosts. 
We provide a half a million dollars in travel funding for people who don't have the financial means to come to our events. And we reinvest the money that we make from these events back into the communities that we serve. So I think I've convinced you that open source is big. But as many of you, for anyone who've ever worked for me, for, and I've been doing this for a very long time, anyone who's ever worked with me knows that I like to say uh, the same thing all the time to this uh, statement here, which is, let's think bigger. Let's do more. This is such an important concept, this idea of collective work, this idea of a sustainable future for the greatest shared technology investment in history is, is critical. And so today we're gonna announce a series of new initiatives that will help accelerate that sustainability loop, that positive feedback loop uh, in uh, open source. The first thing we want is more participation, more organizations coming in and allowing their developers to participate in open source. You see, the biggest bottleneck to the growth of Linux Foundation projects, or frankly, any open source projects, in many cases, if you think about that feedback loop where you know, industry is funding a lot of developers, some developers work voluntarily, but that, that feedback loop, the biggest bottleneck is organizations don't know how to be a participant in open source. They just take the code, they make whatever they make, and that's that. If we can train organizations how to move from consumers to allowing their developers to participate, to becoming major contributors, and then eventually leaders, organizations that are actually open sourcing code in order to share that code with their uh, fellow mankind, we will have significantly moved the needle on the investment and most importantly, the number of developers that are participating in these projects. And so to do that, our to-do group, this is an organization of open source professionals. Think of them as external R&D managers, the people who harvest the billions of dollars of software externally, who help manage that 90% of the code that comes into their products and services, who help bring it into an organization, help their organization modify that code to suit their needs, and then redistribute the changes they make to that open source code back out into the communities. That is a business process, that is a legal process, that is a technical process. It's something you need to know. And this group of open source program managers created a guide that your organization can use to understand those processes too. I wanna just highlight some of these folks and thank them, people like Ibrahim Haddad at Samsung, uh, Sarah Novotny at Google, Will Norris at Google. Google in particular, they not only helped with this guide, but they just open source on their website the entire methodology of how Google works on open source. If you, you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's just an incredibly good read uh, and incredibly uh, helpful. Joe Beta from Heptio, to name just a few, uh, all of these folks are at the top of their game don't reinvent the wheel, learn from them. This will help us get more developers into our world. The second thing we wanna to do to improve the ecosystem and stability of open source projects is to have better project health. Well, well when we started thinking about that, we, we asked ourselves, what does that even mean? And you know, we went back to kind of a quote who was kind of vaguely uh, attributed to uh, Peter Drucker, a, a management uh, guru back in the uh, 70s and 80s, but, it's this idea, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. If you don't know what's going on in these communities, it's gonna be hard to change these communities. And so we created a project called Chaos. So Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software. We love long acronyms in open source. But, you know, it's, it's to answer these questions. You know, will this project be around? What is their trajectory? Is there a diverse community here? Are the people participating from different backgrounds and cultures? Because we already know that diverse communities are more effective communities. That hasn't been proven by open source. That's just been proven in everything, right? But we wanna know what's going on so we can help improve those things. And so a group of organizations, Red Hat, Baturgia, the Eclipse Foundation, Lenaro, Mozilla, OpenStack, and keep going here, uh, have gotten together and are working on deciding what are the right metrics, how can we uh, then create tools that will allow projects to publish those metrics and track them on an ongoing basis. Great work has already been done here. We're integrating a bunch of tools that help check uh, and track license provenance, developer participation, uh, market adoption, and more. 
Red Hat donated technology that they had internally to the project. The Linux Foundation has underwritten a bunch of development for this. Uh, there's been commercial companies that, uh, like Baturgia that uh, have underwritten and open sourced a lot of code for this. This is an incredible project. Go check it out. If we can't measure it, we can't change it. Another thing we want to do to create healthy ecosystems is to create more secure code. Um, how many people uh, have had security on their mind relative to the internet these days? A few? Can anyone guess what uh, might have brought that up? That's right. I, I basically just entered, uh, and I think in the New York Times, a reporter in the New York Times entered Trump in six random numbers, and this came up as well. Uh, the reporter's point was basically even Equifax doesn't quite know <laughs> Everyone, they say everyone was affected. They don't quite know uh, who might have been affected that by this. This may have changed in the last few days as Equifax tries to deal with uh, essentially millions of people's confidential financial information being disclosed on the public internet. Does anybody here happen to know what some of the reports are as to why this happened? Does anybody know? You're reporters right here in the front row. <laughs> But according to uh, William Baird and company, who uh, wrote a report on the data breach, uh, it was an open source software package, uh, Apache Struts, uh, that had a CVE that uh, uh, was one of the reasons uh, that was the, the exploited, essentially, to uh, get in the system. And let me tell you, Apache Struts is a very well-run project. I mean, they have a responsible disclosure policy. They have a security mailing list. These are folks who pretty much know what they were doing. You know, these things happen over time. But it just illustrates the fact that we all depend on open source and we need to have a collective secure coding culture. Nobody can mandate all open source developers need to take secure coding classes. All projects need to have 100% test coverages. All projects need to fuzz their code, lint their code. All projects need to have responsible disclosure policies. All projects need to be able to do threat modeling for their code. You can't mandate that because it's a voluntary effort. Even if people are professionals working on these projects, they're self-forming organic communities. So at the Linux Foundation, a few years ago, we created a project called the Core Infrastructure Initiative. And one of the ideas we had, and some of the folks from that project are here today, was to create a badging program where projects could go and prove that they care about security. And it was not security theater. There was a series of things you had to do to improve the nature of secure coding in your project to get the badge. And the idea is that the badge would indicate you care and start creating a culture of this. Uh, Linus is here, the Linux kernel uh, has passed this program. And we're happy to announce today that over 100 projects have been granted the CII best practice badge. We're really happy about this milestone. We're in particular happy because a lot of the leading projects out there have passed this badging process. And those projects are an example to the other thousand projects who've applied for the badge and for the other tens of thousands of critical projects out there that should apply for this badge. So we're happy about this milestone, but we have oh so far to go. Finally, we need to see more qualified professionals in open source. You know, at the Linux Foundation, training is one of the uh, important things we do. We try and do it either free or at low cost to offer curriculum to get more people in these communities. We've trained hundreds of thousands, over 860,000 uh, developers. We've given hundreds of scholarships, dozens of diversity internships, many, many need-based scholarships just this year. Uh, but today we're announcing a new program called the Kubernetes uh, Certified Service Provider, or, uh, which is basically a way that the industry can help support the Kubernetes project very, very early on in its hyper growth. And what this is, is a combination of our Certified Kubernetes Administrator program. Many of you may not know that, but the Linux Foundation has an anytime, anywhere skills-based certification test, where you can go sign up for this, and you're asked to come into a web interface. In fact, the uh, guy who runs it is right in front of me right now. Uh, the, uh, you come into a web browser, a proctor through your webcam asks you to do a series of tests. You actually have to do it. Jerry, uh, who's right in front of me, helps design these tests. Uh, so you really have to prove you know what you're doing. It's not a multiple choice test. It's you got to do the actual thing you've purported to do. 
And for organizations that have more than three certified Kubernetes administrators, they can get a, become a Kubernetes service provider, uh, and that creates a support ecosystem around that project very, very early that helps grow the project, get more developers, create more value, gets into that feedback loop. So we're very happy about that today. So with that, I just have a few additional announcements, and then I'm going to move on to our next speaker. First, we want to welcome Vodafone to our open network automation platform. I talked about this earlier. Uh, this now grows the number of uh, uh, operators that are working on that project. I want to welcome Samsung to our EdgeX Foundry project. The world's largest device maker has now joined our IoT initiative that's helping, again, to scale uh, computing at the edge of the network. Hitachi has joined our OpenChain project. OpenChain is a project where industry is working to create processes and tools to make it easy to comply with open source licenses, a critical part of the intellectual property obligations of this type of sharing. And so we're super happy to have all these announcements. 2017 has been an amazing year for open source, and we're just getting started. And I have just a few more final things here in closing which is this year at Open Source Summit, we created a whole bunch of additional activities that you, I really encourage all of you to participate in. We have a diversity summit on Thursday. Diverse communities are stronger communities. Please attend this event. It is an important conversation to have. It is important that we embrace this. We have mentoring programs. We have yoga. And finally, that's right, puppies. If, if I could have a puppy right now just like licking my face, I mean, who doesn't like puppies? Uh, we have uh, Puppy Palooza on Wednesday, 10.30 to 12.30. You can come, you can just hug a puppy, you can adopt a puppy. Uh, please do it. We have a great week. I want to thank all of you. 2017 has been a great year uh, so far, and we keep thinking big, uh, and I look forward to seeing you all week. Thank you. <laughs>